So this is the mini symposium. Welcome. Uh, what we're going to do here is pretty simple. Um, we're just going to remind ourselves of the various things going on in the Center for Cosmology and Particle Physics. Um, and we're going to have fairly short talks from a set of people, uh, graduate students, postdocs, uh, and faculty who work in different parts of the group, and they're going to talk briefly about their work. Um, and let's begin. Where's Kate? There she is. Can I get my slide up? You can get your slide up. Um, I have to use the right mouse. Um, I have to put on my glasses. You can just start. Okay. Um, hi everyone, my name is Kate Story Fisher. I am a sixth and hopefully final year PhD student here in the CCPP. Um, I work primarily with David Hogg, uh, but also with Jeremy Tinker, as well as other collaborators that get in here. Um, and I work mostly on uh, methods for large scale structure cosmology, often using data science and statistics. Um, so I have here like some pictures of a few projects that I'll talk about. Um, thanks, Mike, for getting my Google Slides to work so I could mesmerize you with this chip if you just prefer a look at that instead of attention. Um, so uh, before I forget, um, my office is in 914. Um, if you ever want to just come chat about project or anything, and um, you can search my name and find my email that way. Um, but basically what uh, my research and that of the groups I'm in focuses on is trying to extract cosmological information from uh, large surveys um, of galaxy clustering, of galaxies via galaxy clustering, um, as well as other tracers. Um, and this is a problem with cosmology. There's a lot of new um, exciting surveys coming online, but we don't have the methods to um, optimally or maximally extract all the information about the cosmological model that we're interested in, next to a lot of the other work in CCP, because we want to know if there's deviations from the standard uh, lambda CDM model, um, and some of that could be included in galaxy clustering. Um, so just a few um, examples of projects that I've been working on. Um, one is connecting dark matter only simulations to um, full hydrodynamic simulations of galaxy formation and trying to understand the galaxy halo connection um, using machine learning tools that uh, preserve physical symmetry, so trying to do physically motivated um, machine learning. Um, another is, this isn't a very exciting plot, but you'll see a lot of contour plots throughout your time here if you're going to be working on this kind of thing, um, is trying to just constrain some parameters we're interested in. Um, the, Sigma 8, Omega M, etc., um, using uh, machine learning techniques to get at nonlinear scales in um, simulations. Uh, finally, what the GIF is showing is um, a new data set of uh, millions of quasars uh, from the Gaia catalog, which for the Gaia survey, which is a galaxy mission that accidentally captured a bunch of these um, quasars out to really high redshifts. Um, so, uh, Hog and I like to find new data sets and, and see what extra information is there. Um, so this is an exciting new avenue to potentially do some cosmology with that we're just starting. Are you saying Gaia discovered quasars which were known before? Yes, because it's an all-sky survey, and so a lot of the ones in the southern hemisphere um, haven't been observed in, in these large surveys yet. So there's a lot of information yet. Um, if you are interested, happy to talk more, because I'm currently trying to figure out exactly what to do with them. Um, yeah, so if you're interested in any projects along these lines, I'm happy to chat more. One more quick thing is that for first and second years, um, I wanted to take the opportunity to encourage you to apply for fellowships. If you um, aren't, if that's not on your radar yet, it wasn't on mine as an early year, and you only get guaranteed funding for four years in the department. Um, so start Googling um, fellowship opportunities for, for grad students, and I'm happy to talk, talk more about that as well. Anything for professors? Uh, <laughs> good question. I can help you with your grant proposal. Apply for grants. Very helpful. But... <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Are there, other... <laughs> Are there other questions? <laughs> oh, what's the deal with the quasars? You don't know what to do with them? Is it what you said? We have some ideas of what to do with them. I think they're well suited to particular measurements um, because they enclose a really large volume and they're all sky, but there's multiple. But I thought 
there must exist some quasar catalogs or something. Yeah, yeah. Just expanding the quasar catalog isn't it good enough? Um, I think this has particular like properties in addition to some of the other and different properties. Some warts, right? This is um, not a fully spectroscopic survey, um, so it's worse than others in that sense. But it's all sky goes up to higher. So your catalog so. will be not the high quality. It's medium quality, uh, better than the one that gets the worst Yeah. So it's over particular. Is it a redshift for the quasars? So they're spectrophotometric redshifts. So they, they, it's low resolution spectra that have redshift estimates, but a lot of them are wrong. So we're using methods to improve those by bringing in the chunk rate. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And here, here's our list of speakers. Uh, and so Oren will be next. Only the first three have slides, as far as I know. Any of the others have slides, you better let me know now. Where are you, Oren? Where are your slides here? There you go. <laughs> great. Uh, is that good enough? Yeah, that's great. That's fine. OK. <laughs> OK, so hey, I'm Oren. I'm a postdoc uh, here. Um, and broadly, I work uh, in phenomenology and astroparticles. So this is a picture that I took in uh, Nevada in the desert. Uh, There's some observation station and what you can see here it says the anomaly makes me feel fine. Right? This is Nicholas Cage. And so generally, our field is the field where we take anomalies and also take observations and try and explain them through um, you know, particle physics. And the things that make us feel fine are mostly anomalies, I would say also fine tuning. So anywhere where observations don't really match the theory, or where there is some small number that is difficult to explain, those are the kind of things that we go after. So examples of these things are things like the hierarchy problem, neutrino masses, the strong CP problem, dark matter, dark energy, uh, all of those things kind of fall into these category of either anomalies or fine tuning. Um, and so I personally work mostly on dark matter. And um, let, me, uh, let me give you just an example of something that I've been working on uh, kind of over the last few years. And so um, <clears throat> this is an example of a paper that uh, we published about uh, end of last year, where we found that if you look at self-interacting models of dark matter, models where dark matter particles scatter efficiently with themselves, and you take observations from small satellite galaxies around the Milky Way, dwarf galaxies, and you ask where are these theories inconsistent? And we were searching for a signal, but we found a region where the theory was inconsistent with observations. We were able to rule out a big chunk of the parameter space in the cross-section parameters. Okay, and this is for a theory that is completely secluded from the standard model. So a theory that doesn't speak to the standard model at all, just has self scatterings. What we found is that you're forced into a region of parameter space where there's a very interesting phenomena that has to occur called gravithermal collapse, where the centers of these objects collapse rapidly into a very small and dense kind of central core. And so what I've been working on in the last uh, few months mostly, and over the summer we published one paper um, which is relevant to this, is we're looking for signals that are observables of this gravithermal core collapse. So this is from a paper that was published during the summer. And yeah, we found there's actually a correlation between whether you collapse and you don't and the baryonic properties of an object. So for example, the ratio of the baryonic to total mass of the object, the ratio of the radius, the half-light radius to the burial radius of the object. Found that for certain cross sections, only beyond certain values of those two things, those two ratios, do you ever have the hope to collapse? So that's an example of an observable signal. And hopefully, in the next few months, I'm going to be publishing some other results that also have to do with signals of this very kind of catastrophic um, behavior over here. So, other people in uh, CCPP who are relevant for this kind of work are Ken, Josh. Neil, also a lot of the astrophysics people like Yassine. 
Sorry? Oh. These last names. Okay, Ken Van Tilburg, <laughs> Neil Weiner, Josh Ruderman, Yassin Ali Hamoud, Hog. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and the postdoc that are relevant, I think, are me, Hong Wan Lu, David Dansky, uh, Chris Desert, and um, I guess Cyril as well, who's kind of a visitor here, but it's around. Um, and I think, uh, I think those are many of the people who are relevant for this field. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's my introduction to this. Any questions? A little one, literally silly one. So this, this Abbott collapse you're talking about, can, can do these things form black holes? You can form that, it depends on the cutoff of the theory, so yeah. I mean, eventually you reach some kind of... And when you say that you're looking for signatures, you're looking for other kind of signatures. Yeah, but the signatures that I've, I've been thinking of, like nothing that has to do with black holes, I haven't been able to think of anything relevant for that, but in principle, you can form black holes at the centers of the centers. Can you, for this one, what are the allowed regions and what are the not allowed regions? White is allowed. White is allowed. White is allowed. Okay. White. Even though it undergoes a collapse, I thought normal dark matter doesn't undergo a collapse. Well, so in this case, um, central regions of objects such as Draco and Ursa Minor, these are satellites of the Milky Way, actually have measurements of their velocity dispersions at the center that are consistent with a very high density at the center. So at least for those objects, you have self-interactions that are in an intermediate range, that would cause a coring that is inconsistent with observations. So it just causes all it co when you think of collapse, are you just, saying just think of a sharp prof a profile that has kind of a, high, a sharp power law percent. <laughs> then it necessarily undergoes a collapse close enough to the center. Or something. Or I mean, it, because it, I, I normal dark matter does not do any collapse, right? right. Does it in your terminology? At Correct. Least. Yeah. So CDM. now you introduce these interactions. And you mess up the properties of uh, normal collisionless dark matter. And are you saying even after this collapse, it is still consistent with observations? For these small yeah. objects, yes, and it doesn't mess up anything with like much larger objects because baryons are involved in all sorts of other reasons. So for satellites, some of them, the ones that you know, there's other properties that determine whether you collapse or you don't. So, but at least for some of the smaller objects, cross sections and concentrations and things like that are such that they must have collapsed in order to be consistent with observations. And it doesn't mess up things for larger objects because of the temperature of those larger objects and so on. And how will you see this hypothetical collapse? So I, I, that's an unknown answer. Like, I don't know the answer to that question yet. But for example, what we found is that like, there's a correlation between these two ratios and the cross section, whether you collapse or not. So maybe you can try and you know use this kind of result to search for this. But it's unclear, right? Like, I don't know. You have to be able to distinguish this from way over to the left. You're saying this way over to the left is also allowed. Right, exactly. Right. And, and so, the reason this is allowed, <laughs> but this, is, point. this is just CDM. Right, right. right? This, is, this is just CDM. Right, right. So they look similar in this plot, but yeah, there might be some other differences, and that's what we're trying to search for. Just getting back to the black hole question, will there be a way to distinguish this black hole from regular black hole, regular black hole? I don't think so. But of a range of masses. Yeah, maybe. I mean, there have been papers in the past where they like produce very large seeds for AGNs with this kind of mechanism. But it's for a very small fraction of dark matter <coughs> with a very, very large cross section. And you can produce seeds that act into the six solar masses, explain things like AGN, you know, like black hole, um, the very large supermassive black hole that people see. But yeah, I, I haven't thought about that too carefully, and I don't think it's a very useful thing for like, if, if you're 100% black matter. <clears throat> okay. Anything else? Okay. Okay. Next up we have Sarah Gandhi. I'm sharing it as it is. There we go. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Sudhir Sharagandhi, and I'm a fifth year graduate student working with Professor Yasin Ali Kamoud. 
Um, and in a nutshell, what I work on is the theoretical analysis of scattering between dark matter and baryons, and what effect that might have on um, cosmological observables such as the CMB, uh, the cosmic microwave background. Um, so why should this be the thing that keeps you up at night? Um, I have a schematic here that um, hopefully will motivate the insomnia. So um, there can be any number of the kinds of interactions between dark matter and standard model particles. Um, going this way, people look for standard model particles that might have been produced um, because dark matter self-interacted and annihilated at some point in the past. Um, and that's the indirect detection of dark matter. Uh, going this way, people try and produce dark matter at colliders by smashing together standard model particles at very high energies. Um, and then finally, there's direct detection going um, either up or down. Um, and there we are looking for events where dark matter comes and directly hits a standard model particle. Um, and there are a bunch of terrestrial direct detection experiments looking for such a signal. But um, so far, none of these channels has led to a detection which would tell us what dark matter is made of. So we keep looking, and in particular, for direct detection, um, the terrestrial search has become somewhat saturated, so people are turning towards cosmological and astrophysical probes, um, which can actually be used to explore parameter space, which is complementary to that of the terrestrial experiments. So um, we have multiple cosmological and astrophysical probes that, are, that have already been used to constrain these interactions um, at the top. There is spectral distortion of the CMB, um, deviations of the frequency spectrum away from um, the CMB frequency spectrum away from a perfect black body. And then we have CMB temperature, polarization, temperature and polarization anisotropies, um, the 21 centimeter brightness temperature, Lyman alpha forest, um, and the distribution of satellite galaxies around the Milky Way. And these are just a few examples, and then we have more data coming up from Simon's Observatory and Rubin Observatory in the next few years. And then the CMB um, stage four experiment, which should become operational by the end of the decade. So my point being that the experimentalists are crushing it. They are providing us with pristine sub-percent level um, precision data. And so as theorists, it's sort of our responsibility to make sure that we have theories and predictions that match up to that level of accuracy and precision. So um, that is basically what I work on with Yasin. We try and identify assumptions and approximations that people make in the standard formalism, which aren't completely justified and might lead to inaccuracies, um, but they're still widely used because otherwise calculations become completely intractable. And these approximations might even land us in the right ballpark as far as results are concerned. But again, with precision cosmology, the size of this ballpark is rapidly shrinking. And so our theories need to be able to keep up. Um, another important part of this job is to make sure that we are fully exhausting the potential <laughs> of the data that we have, because we know that there's um, all these probes that will show deviations from lambda CDM if there is dark matter and baryon scattering. But um, the kind of deviation that we search for as theorists can make a huge difference as to how constraining the data can be. Uh, so yeah, that's a preview to what I do. But um, please, if you want to talk more, um, you can send me an email, or my office is right here. Um, <coughs> stop by. So, since you obviously don't know how these interactions could be and whatever, wouldn't it be wiser to just look for deviations from uh, standard cosmology in the data first and having discovered, cannot you look for these anomalies without knowing what these anomalies are? Well. Right, because you are saying if there is such and such interaction between standard model and dark matter, yeah. there will be some funny fourth order correlation in the temperature of the CMP. Mm -hmm. Suppose 
cannot you start from the other end? Like, because I also do the same thing, like non gaussianities, whatever, just wasted three months, whatever, and then, uh, but uh, so far they find nothing. So shouldn't we let them find it first and get to calculations next? And as far as I know, the four point coordination functions have not been um, exactly. shown to like, be non zero at, from coming from these theories. Like, if you start with sort of a generic model, uh, then you can calculate what effect that model would have and if that fits the data. I guess we are going the other direction, um, but I think both directions are sort of equally valid. Because if, if you have room in the data to have deviations, then you can try and explain those the room that you have in the But is it really impossible to look for the, for those deviations blindly without being guided by some theory? Can we do that or not? I think Yasin's point was theory helps to look for deviations. Do you agree? Um, I mean the way I know how it sort of the general process would work is that you start from a somewhat general but still specific enough interaction term and then you calculate what effect that would have, what non gaussianity that would lead to. Um, I don't know how to go. The other way around. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, otherwise you make your measurement and you place a limit, you don't know whether it's an interesting limit or not. But I, I don't understand. Aren't you people like Hog or whatever, by evasion, whatever? <laughs> Just say, already, Andre considers me and Hog the same person. <laughs> <laughs> you people who love the data, cannot you do it without theorists at all? Yeah, it's just you don't know what it means, right? But right, to you... claim that there is some deviation from standard, suppose I, I only respect standard called dark matter. This gives a unique prediction. Cannot you look at the data and says no, the stupid thing doesn't work? Yeah, you can you can do that. And people have done it and there's cases where it's like there like are common cases, tension or whatever. Yeah, there are things, yeah. And so it, and then but it's not the case that um but there are lots of cases where that's not true like where things seem to agree and you just have no idea should we work harder on seeing the next factor of 10 like for example there's you know to there's there's curvature right so we know within a few times 10 to the minus 3 that the universe is flat right so do is it interesting to go to 10 to the minus 4, if that's a thing we can do in the next generation of experiments? Or do we really have to get to 10 to the minus 6, in which case we should be thinking of totally different things to do? And the answer is, actually, 10 to the minus 4 starts to get kind of interesting. And that motivates you in a different way, because you have some idea of what the, you know, what the standard inflationary theory would say. If you don't, you know, if you don't have limits like that of what would be interesting, and it's hard to, and it is hard to make judgments about what to do next, like whether it'll be interesting. Okay. All right. Thank you. Do you have any other questions for Sarah? All right. So Andre's next. Everyone so you can. Uh, <laughs> We have our chance to, I, need a blackboard. I know you need a blackboard and this is this is the tricky part i have to do this oh, yeah, without... can you use this piece of the blackboard it's okay yes you can i would but nobody else is using slides so i'd like to get this up does anybody know how i do that uh, room control oh you mean without uh, cutting off the camera Let's see how that did. Did I lose the camera? No, I didn't lose the camera. All right. Uh, we need a lighting change. OK, so my name is Andre. I have been here forever. <laughs> um, and uh, 
it's really impossible to describe what I do, but in simple terms, perhaps I really love theoretical physics and I apply it to various problems in astrophysics and cosmology. The range of problems uh, is at the it's not higher or lower. It's uh, on one end. It it uh, probably the closest to reality thing which I have ever done was evaporation of planetary atmospheres. And on the other end of the spectrum is, for example, what I call elastic <coughs> inflation, but it became known later as solid inflation. It's an idea that, so here the idea goes back to Bob Johnson, who is sitting over there. So he told us uh, some time ago that to calculate how atmosphere of Pluto evaporates, you really need to do molecular dynamics simulation because at high enough altitudes, the particles stop colliding before they run away. And so in his group in uh, Virginia, correct? Uh, they calculated the rate of atmospheric escape by molecular dynamic simulations, like literally, you put all your molecules with some scalings, of course, into your computer, let them collide, escape. The problem itself is kind of funny if you do esoteric things like um, whatever, string theory or something, probably it's not obvious to you that atmospheres should evaporate, or maybe it is, you are theorists, right? Because if you take an atmosphere of a planet, right, suppose you, uh, how to say it, you just give some time for this atmosphere to settle into equilibrium, then the equilibrium will be Boltzmann equilibrium, right? It will acquire some temperature. After all, the processes have undergone their course. But if it is Boltzmann, then the density is e to minus m phi over t. Phi at infinity, however, goes to zero, which means that the density of the atmosphere should be constant rather than zero at infinity but then it would require infinite mass. So for me, and I knew nothing of course about it, and uh, even that thing that atmospheres should constantly evaporate was news to me, uh, but uh, with uh, Bob's help and whatever, I showed how to compute this thing in pure hydro rather than with molecular dynamic simulations, even though Bob's work was still a justification for why my pure hydro works, otherwise it would not be trustworthy. So anyway, so this is one end. The other end is things which don't exist, uh, <laughs> like uh, elastic inflation. I remember uh, I, I did a lot of papers on inflation, like non-Gaussianities from inflation, and I remember I was once giving a talk on inflation um, at uh, Weizmann, and my host, who is high energy astrophysicist, uh, okay, I was doing inflation just as a side uh, dish or whatever. And my host said, oh, you explained it so well. And I said, but you understand the, uh, the chances that this is correct uh, are negligibly small. There are, there are so many different theories. And he said, I'm not saying that I liked what you did. I'm saying you explained it very well. <laughs> so, so here is in inflation business, really, the situation is that probably there was an inflation. It solves so many problems of cosmology. But, uh, but we don't really know what was inflating. The simplest models like m squared, phi squared, massive scalar, they fail on account of gravitational waves. So people are inventing new and new and new <coughs> models of inflation, hoping to come up with an observable, which will put their particular theory of inflation, uh, make it testable, so to speak. So as an example of this thing, like I said, the elastic thing, I just assumed 
that what was inflating was not a field or whatever, it was a relativistic rubber. Relativistic rubber, imagine theory of elasticity, but make it relativistic. Mm -hmm. So that's why people called it solid inflation later and people worked on it, whatever. Uh, or, 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 or recently, for example, with our former graduate student, Mirdad Mirbabai, we invented another theory of He invented, I just calculated for him. Um, it was this so-called warm inflation uh, where the temperature of the universe was finite and the warming was accomplished by sphaleron transitions. Okay, so basically I know a little more or less about everything and so if you wish to talk to me I will be happy to and with probability of 50, this is to professors and graduate students with probability of 15% by historical record, <laughs> we will do a paper together. So, um, but not postdocs. Postdocs and professors, no, no postdocs okay. Right? <laughs> students probably is a little too early. This. Okay, and the last thing I wanted to say, because I understand this is for the benefit mostly of graduate students. So obviously, it's hard to understand whether or not it's valuable or whether or not it's even correct. Uh, but I think one criterion for a graduate student can be common preferences. So let me show you. I've read recently an article where a famous mathematician created a minimal requirement, mathematical requirement for physicists. And so let me show you two little problems from this list which I consider beautiful. So if you are a graduate student and you consider these problems beautiful, plus you can solve them, I will be happy to uh, work with you. So uh, here is problem number one. Calculate the limit of when x goes to zero. Sin 10 x minus 10 x over a sin. A sin means inverse sinus. Do we pronounce it in English sinus? Sin, sin. No, sin. just sin. Sin, right. Otherwise, it's like a no. Right? <laughs> a sin, a ten, x minus a ten, a sin, x. So this is one problem. Uh, this mathematician claims <laughs> that people like uh, Hooke and Newton would solve this problem within 30 seconds, but present-day mathematicians are totally impotent. Um, so this is problem number one. Um, problem number two is this. Uh, two people play one person, let's say me, I have a bag full of what do you call it? Nickels and quarters. <laughs> You've been and in this country for like 30 years. <laughs> but, but coins are no longer in use. That's true. <laughs> yeah, and they cannot name a single baseball player. That's also true. Okay. Uh, another person has a bag full of dimes. Uh, they played the following game. This guy puts one of the coins like this and you with a bag of dimes hold you say five or 25. Five. I, I open it <laughs> if it is five you get it if it is not five you give me ten clear right if it was 25 you get it if wrong again i pay you ten question who will win Okay, that's it. <laughs> Do we have questions? Oh, questions. <laughs> you questions? put the tin back in your bag? If you no, no, those are infinite bags, so okay. it doesn't matter where I put it. We just keep playing this thing again and again and again. For example, if I always do 25, you will always say 25, I lose. So I have to be more inventive. Oh, you get to choose. It's not a random. We are real people. I have a bag, you have a bag. I give you this, you call. If you are right, you get it. If you are wrong, I get your turn. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. I mean, I don't have a... Sura. Are you the only one who offered the coin? Like, do you speak coins or...? 
Sergei has a bag full of tens. I have a bag full of five and twenty-five, infinite supply. I choose something, he calls. If he is right, he gets it. If he is wrong, he pays me ten. We keep going ad infinitum. Yeah. I claim that there will be a winner here. If you have infinite amount of points, why don't you just invest money? <laughs> <laughs> there was some other question, please. But if you both have infinite points, what constitutes winning? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it's the no, net difference. So, what, what, what do you mean by <laughs> win? Zero, so. There is, as, as we keep going, even though there are infinities, there is also a flow of money. Okay? Which direction the money will be flowing? <laughs> so I can beat your uh, little tricks. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> you have to solve it. All In right. Thank you, Andre. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking his handwriting looks a lot like mine, and then I, I realized he's a right. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, my name is uh, David Donsky. Uh, I'm a new postdoc here, um, and I, I have some some uh, projects I like to discuss. I don't know if they're as fun as uh, the games that we were just talking about, but let me tell you a little bit about my interests. Uh, some work that I've done, and if you're interested, uh, you can come to my office uh, at 9.51. All right, so I've got uh, some interest in generally uh, studying uh, beyond the standard model physics and ways to probe it using uh, early universe cosmology. Uh, gravitational wave physics. And uh, topological defects. So these are all somewhat related. Logical. Uh, as well as um, astroparticle physics. And a little bit of plasma physics, too. Here, here. Sorry? I do plasma yeah. physics. Oh, yeah? Two cheers for plasma physics. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> all right. Um, so I think these are, are pretty exciting uh, avenues to, to probe some uh, physics beyond the standard model, especially some gravitational wave physics. So for instance, like Yassine was talking about at his talk on Friday, uh, that now is kind of the time to, to look in, into gravitational wave physics and why is this so amazing? And it's really amazing because gravitational waves uh, can basically travel unimpeded through the early universe and they can probe uh, time scales much earlier than the time of roughly 300,000 years after the Big Bang when light electromagnetic radiation is opaque because the universe is a plasma and light can scatter very efficiently. So the key thing is about gravitational waves is you need a source in the early universe. And if you could probe them uh, today, you could potentially understand things about physics at very, very high energies uh, right after the Big Bang. Uh, so for instance, I was working pre previously on a project about uh, looking at uh, topological defects like magnetic monopoles, cosmic strings, and domain walls that form in grand unified theories that can, that can break in the very early universe. So for instance, you can get magnetic monopoles in some grand unified theories. And in some of these uh, subset of grand unified theories, you can get, for instance, this uh, symmetry that's associated with the monopole can break. And what happens is you get the magnetic fields of the monopoles get squeezed into flux tubes because the U1 symmetry associated with, with it breaks, unlike, for instance, normal electromagnetism of our photon today. And those uh, flux tubes are what's called cosmic strings. And you can get really interesting dynamics of these topological defects in the early universe. And you can understand what kind of gravitational wave signal those make. And if you could uh, detect those today, you can infer very useful information about grand unified theories, which is things are happening at energy scales extremely, extremely high. So it's really, really pretty cool uh, physics that you can, you can uh, uncover. So I have some ideas, for instance, for graduate students uh, or anyone uh, who's interested, I have some ideas about uh, some new gravitational wave signals that uh, you could potentially detect um, or can be calculated and, and potentially be detected. Uh, so for instance, for like domain walls, as far as I know, no one's done really an analytic solution for what the gravitational wave signal for a domain wall should be. People have done some recent numerical work and so we know what kind of spectrum it should be. Do you mean, you mean a, 
projected with in the kilohertz right now or Future well, that the, the frequency depends on the domain wall itself. So this is a free parameter. It depends on, for instance, the domain wall tension. But for arbitrary class of domain walls, you have some uh, some sort of motion of the wall, and to detect or to compute what kind of gravitational wave signal you get from that, like what's the frequency dependence of it. Uh, as far as I know, that hasn't been analytically computed before. So the numerical simulations that exist, I mean, to some extent, yeah. Not surprisingly, I think they reproduce what people have done. You know, for bubble walls in phase transitions, right. you know, there's some curvature radius, and in both right. cases, there is some so-called like envelope approximation that people have used. Right. So that's for walls in like in a scaling regime, I think, and you have like large scale walls. But for instance, whether that applies for a friction case or many of these theories, the walls are are uh, uh, scatter very efficiently with the background plasma. Right. And so uh, the, the the dynamics can be a little bit different there. So, you know, for instance, some analytical approach for that could be a little bit different. Um, you can get some information about that. But like some very simple like estimate for that. Uh, so uh, that could potentially be some 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 uh, some uh, project that we could we could talk about for just a sort of like a vibrating wall membranes, for instance, not like sort of these bubble collisions that um, you know, like in a first order phase transition that expand and, and collide. So you can get gravitational wave signals uh, from there too. Um, so another avenue I like to, to also discuss is. Can I sorry say something? I yeah. think Yuri Levin, who is at this uh, Simon's whatever, yeah. he actually was interested in uh, exactly those things, right. like gravitational waves from vibrating membranes yeah, yeah. and whatever. So it's in, and he will be here soon. It okay. looks like we you guys can use for talk. talk. Okay, yeah. cool, cool. Um, so there could be some, yeah. So there's a lot of you know papers from the '80s on when a lot of these defects uh, were, were first discussed. Um, so there's some some uh, you know interesting papers and work from there that that uh, uh, can we can we can talk about and, and look more. But just very briefly, uh, I also am very interested in astroparticle physics and, and plasma physics. So I can tell you a little bit about some project uh, that I'm working on and some relevant uh, project that you guys may be interested uh, that uh, is associated with it. And for instance, in many theories beyond the center model, uh, we have an additional U1 symmetry, for instance, like another, like a dark photon. And what's very special about the U1 symmetries is that uh, you can mix, for instance, our photon and a dark photon via kinetic mixing. And in some cases, for instance, if this dark photon gets a mass, you can get uh, sort of um, uh, oscillations between our photon and the dark photon in a similar, uh, in a similar way of just uh, neutrino oscillations, because there's a difference between the mass basis and, 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 the, and the interaction basis. And one way to potentially detect these guys uh, is uh, through a kind of a light shining through a uh, wall experiment. And so what some, what some way people do this is they take a laser, they literally shine it through a, a piece of metal and they try and detect photons on the other side of the metal. And the way it's done is because or they're hoping some of this, these photons will actually convert to a dark photon before hitting the metal. They cross through the metal unimpeded because normally a metal is absorbed uh, photons. And on the other side, they can convert back to a photon. So I'm thinking about doing this potentially in, in actually in outer space, a light shining through kind of a dust experiment. So in many parts of the interstellar medium, if you just look up, you'll see very uh, black clouds, right? Uh, so especially north near the galactic center. Uh, so potentially these clouds can be used or can act effectively as walls. And so you can look at starlight, for instance, that produces photons, and you have some sort of dust cloud with very, very high extinction. And if you can convert to a photon, or excuse me, a dark photon before the photon enters a cloud, it can travel unimpeded, it won't be absorbed. It can potentially convert back to a photon, and we can observe this today, where you can see actually light, optical light, for instance, where you would not expect any light to be because the extinction is so high. So that is that these walls act, or these dusts act like effective walls. So I was thinking also that this can be applied as well to axions. And I just ran the numbers a little bit this weekend, and I think you could potentially get some new constraints on, on very, very light axions in a similar manner. And for the axions, they actually will need a magnetic field to convert. But luckily, the interstellar medium has a roughly microgauss magnetic field, and you can get some very cool uh, oscillations between axions and, and, and photons and back and, and, and uh, constrain very uh, uh, large scales of the axion decay constant question. So just sort of naively, I would think that, you know, you set up a lab experiment, like maybe put, as you said, like a metal plate right. 
that's a very controlled environment. Like you can probably, you know, dial up the intensity of your laser right. and then do a little photon count on the other side. Exactly. Whereas an interstellar like dust probably has some very complicated structure and it's maybe hard to know exactly what the extinction is going to be. And I, will you really get much stronger limits from looking at it astrophysically? Yeah. Like so, a lab experiment? Yeah, yeah. So you lose in a couple different ways astrophysically. You lose in the magnetic field that you can get. Like in the lab, you can get, you know, Tesla magnetic fields. But the typical interstellar medium, the magnetic field is going to be like micro gauss, right? Um, however, you can you can bump up your probability of conversion or oscillation by the length scales that you deal with in astrophysical environments. So you may have a couple meter long experiment terrestrially, but you can have parsec size uh, interaction regions here, right? The clouds here. Um, as far as I understand, you can estimate, for instance, the typical uh, extinctions, and some of these are absolutely enormous, right? Uh, so even with the uncertainties and the optical depths, you're doing e to the minus that power, even with the uncertainty, right? And that uncertainty, that probability is so, so small for the number of photons that you actually would expect. So I think the whole point of the wall is just to act like a, 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 the whole point of the dust is just to act as a wall. The actual dynamics of conversion happens outside, for instance. And but so, wouldn't it be easier to put a little star in front of the cloud than to do your conversion? Oh, yeah, yeah. So the, oh, the uh, exactly. cloud here? Well, you won't, how, what are you detecting? Here you're detecting light, optical light, where you would not expect optical light to be. But why do you say you will not expect? Maybe there is a little something in front of the cloud which emits right into your telescope. Uh, right, so you have to be careful with, like for instance, correlating that with all the little point stars behind it, for instance. Like we can see where the point stars are located by looking in the far infrared, because the scattering is very weak in the infrared. So this is awesome. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Actually, we should have a very long conversation about this. Because it could be, I mean, this is extremely interesting. Uh, and I have like a bunch of questions of my own. Yeah, yeah. But we should move on. Yes, no problem. Thank no you, problem. David. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 951, if you're interested. <laughs> goals or themes uh, underlying my research right now. So one of them, very broadly, is to uncover the quantum theory of gravity that, for example, the main star universe describes what we see. And the second thing, um, so this is a sort of problems-based motivation. The second is more method-based, so that would be to discover new structures within existing science frameworks theories. <laughs> and so by new structure, I mean things like new organizing principles, or principles of simplification and existing framework for theories, things like quantum field theory, general relativity, and so on. Okay. And so, yeah, like this second part, you can think of it somewhat similar to spirit to um, Econ Wang's. Uh, work on what work. do you mean new structure? Something like gravity give... from thermodynamics or something? No, no, no. I'm going to give you very specific ah, examples. Ah, you will give specific is, examples. This is, this is, okay. Very process. So now we're going to get more specifically. So what do, and I'm going to tell you also this, the relationship between these two. So quantum theory of gravity. So in particular, what I work on is um, holography or asymptotically flat space times. And now people call this field slash holography. And uh, in particular, what I work on here is I'm interested in what you might say is origins of universal behavior. And 
so in particular, there's sort of two common explanations. One is that you're looking at some sort of infrared sector of your theory, or alternatively, your theory emits a symmetry, and this protects observables from any sort of non-universal aspects. And so what I think about is, if they might be related and how so. Okay, so that's in slightly more detail. And sort of the highest level of detail is, so the specific proposal here is that uh, scattering amplitudes uh, in a quantum theory of gravity are holographically dual to correlation functions in a 2D conformal field theory. That symbol has a very different meaning <laughs> in my field. <laughs> oh, it means approximately. It means <laughs> But you mean you mean the dual isomorphic. I was just making a joke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I did. I did. Uh, and so, you know, at, at some level you can <clears throat> One way you can think of philosophy, so philosophy is the idea that a quantum theory of gravity can be captured uh, by uh, a dual theory that lives in fewer dimensions and doesn't have gravity. So in some ways, you might think of philosophy as basically our way of trying to use quantum field theory to still learn about quantum gravity in a way that's constraining beyond you know, effective field theory. There's you know, standard effective field theory approach to gravity at low energies. And um, and here, so uh, you know, specific to this context, it turns out that so in scattering, there is uh, an equivalence between. Um, a per particular type of universality that's seen in the infrared and a universality due to symmetry. And that is that <coughs> so called soft theorems in quantum field theory um, are, in fact, equivalent to uh, Ward identities, which you can think of as basically the like quantum version of um, observation laws uh, due to symmetry. And so soft theorems are essentially statements in quantum field theory that if you look at scattering amplitudes in which uh, low energy particles are emitted, that they take some universal form. And yeah, so these can be identified as equivalent to board identities for symmetries, and it turns out these symmetries, it's a very large symmetry group, they're infinite dimensional. And so um, uh, this in turn uh, informs what I do here, because uh, that equivalence implies that the scattering amplitudes, or equivalently these correlation functions, uh, enjoy an infinite dimensional symmetry, and so the, the symmetry um, is uh, supplying some uh, structure, some intrinsic structure to the punitive uh, to the conformal field theory. Yeah, maybe I should stop now and ask for questions. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So in celestial geography, you typically sum up all, all the energy. It's mainly transformed form. So you, you go to the real to the, right? the center, you iterate it yes. all the energy. That's the reason. That, that's the reason. Is that the reason why you expect celestial geography to be able to improve the quantum machine in the sense of the 
try, but we're seeing not the here. Because um, since since you're interacting over all the energies, I will say that you should start. Okay, sure, sure. So I mean, let me say, um, you know, a question in quantum gravity is what are the scattering amplitudes, right? Scattering amplitudes, right? We know the low energy description of them, right, from effective field theory, but we don't know. You know, if you use effective field theory, it doesn't tell you what the incompletion completion is supposed to be, right? Like you have to fix an infinite number of coefficients or something like that. Now, in yeah, you know, technically, to there's a technical thing in this field of how exactly you want to see that scattering amplitude should be interpreted as correlation function in this involved Snellen transform, um, but I think that for, you know, you should think of that more as, um, you know, if you really do believe that, you know, local quantum field theories are so, at some level capturing gravity, some sort of holographic correspondence, it doesn't mean that the way that you were necessarily originally thinking about your observables in quantum gravity is the right language or the right, just even in this case, basis to see that it's a local quantum field theory. And so that's the way you should think about the knowledge transform. It's not. Um, well, my question is, since when you're making the translation, you make this. I'm saying that you could have done. You could have. You could have applied. There's no. Re there's no logical reason why you couldn't have applied that to just the ordinary scattering amplitudes in momentum space. They're just going to look incomprehensible if you're going to try and interpret them in the dual theory. But there's not. There's not a logical reason why you can't. Well, I mean, you're integrating over all the energies, so does it make sense to start with some UV non-complete theory? No, it's supposed to describe the UV complete theory. That's the goal. Yes. I have a request, yes. not a question. Can you give a brown bag and put some flesh onto yes, this yes. beautiful plate? <laughs> yes, but I thought plate. it would not be nice to do that in seven minutes. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> she will. Oh, it's we do not require to do that. I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. <laughs> Uh, I'm just trying to understand this slide a little bit more. So we have these soft theorems, right? So you're saying there's some correspondence in the like, UV complete theory to some infinite dimensional gauge symmetry or something? So you don't even need to say UV complete theory because, uh, I mean, the soft theorems you can do are item perturbation theory. And yeah, sure, I'll explain this in a brown bag, but there's essentially, there's a formal argument that you can always take something that's in the form of a soft theorem and rewrite it as a word identity. So in, in other words, you can always write soft theorems essentially in some form of sure. like an S matrix commuting with the charge. Right, right, right. And at some level, once you realize what this is, the only non-trivial thing is what the charge is. Like once you understand. Yes. Yeah. Uh, right. So what's the so infinite it's dimensionality it's here? Like it's some okay, infinite so, dimensionality so, group or something. But, so there's there's several infinite dimensionalities. One of them is that so the reason why there's this it's a 2D conformal field theory is that you reinterpret the Lorentz group as the global conformal group of two dimensions. So there's that's LPC. <clears throat> and so there's an infinite dimensional enhancement. Sorrow, which you might be familiar with, or that yeah. Okay, so this is this is something you see in in, in two conformal field sure. theories. There's another infinite dimensional enhancement, which is that it turns out so soft theorems you literally take your your S matrix and expand about some energy, some zero energy, and every order in the expansion you can pull out a universal piece, and so. Um, there's actually another infinite dimension. So this one was actually like turns out the order to make it to the zero piece. But for each of these, there's yeah some other infinite dimensional enhancement. We put those all together. It was recently discovered that this is some other known symmetry out large symmetry algebra called W one plus infinity, which appears in other physical systems. And yeah, that's like. Something new that has happened in the last year. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. That was great. I'm going to totally abuse Sergey by saying, be very quick. <laughs> <laughs>
So my name is Sergei Dubovsky, and present under his reference point. I've been here probably not like roughly half of forever, <laughs> <laughs> which is probably also forever for most people here. Uh, and I guess the main reason Mike invited me to uh, speak here is because there is a new initiative which happened recently, which I'm part of it, and will be quite a few activities probably also here related to that, namely. Uh, there is science collaboration on confinement and QCD strings. So there will be students, there will be postdocs, there will be some conferences. So you witness some activities for the next just four years coming from there. Uh, so I'll say a few couple of words about that. Uh, and well, this is a collaboration which combines unified like, roughly 13 PIs, I'm one of them. And there are people doing lattice QCD and there are string theorists and, and all the way in between. And as you can guess from the uh, uh, name, the goal is to understand confinement. It's about strong interactions. So I'll give a small pitch for why I think this is an exciting problem. And probably I should have, I, I have some understanding, uh, some explanation to do here because, well, I came here, as I already said, a long time ago, and I was hired as a kind of beyond the standard model physicist. Well, actually, officially, that was a search for astrophysicists, but I think. <laughs> it was a search for a cosmologist. We hired right. you and an astronomer. Right. So, so, yeah, so, yeah, we, on average, it was a cosmologist. But I think people, <laughs> <laughs> I think people were realizing that they're not hiring astrophysicists. Uh, but I think, at least I also, I myself viewed you at the time as so At the time, you were claiming that the black holes would be slowed down by the emission of those particles. Yeah, they may still be it's all down by <laughs> Yeah, that's true. And so that's, and if somebody told me back then, then 10 years from then I will be doing QCD, I would think that this is a bad, jo a bad joke. Uh, because I always thought that's kind of the hardest and most boring part of the standard model. Uh, but kind of in the heart, I'm still beyond the standard model physicist. And let me explain why I think that. that why I'm doing what I'm doing and that's uh, So I think while well, they're thinking about beyond the standard model physics, I see three things to do. One, to think about ways to discover new things which are not discovered yet. It's getting harder and harder and more, probably that's what we should be doing. Like Ken, I think, is doing mostly that. I mean, thinking about new ways to discover things. Uh, well, another uh, kind of all of those motivation to come up with a smart idea, predict what will be discovered soon. And uh, that's the fastest get, way to get to Stockholm, I guess, if you're, if you're right. But it's getting harder and harder because uh, just experimentally, because of the first question. So I think it's more important right now to think about new ways to discover things rather than predictions for what yet can be discovered at the existing experiments. So. Uh, and finally, uh, and another thing was, at least for me, that was always a hope that the experiment will come up with something which will be, will, will very hard to understand, it will change our understanding of physics, of quantum field theory and gravity and space time, etc. Uh, and well, after a while, I realized that maybe we have such a thing already being discovered, and this is strong interactions. And uh, just let me say one word about that. And uh, one word, uh, as you all know, there is a parameter in the strong interactions, which is NC, which is the number of colors. Uh, and for theoretical purposes, it's all, all, often good to take the limit when this parameter is taken to infinity. And actually, it's not such a bad approximation for, for real world. Uh, uh, well, no, it, it's not a joke. Many, many of the properties of strong interactions, that's a very good starting point to understand many, many, many things. Uh, uh, but uh, from theoretical point of view, something remarkable happens in this limit, namely, well, in QCD, you all know there are quarks are connected by confining strings, we don't really see them because strings, as you're trying to pull works apart, st strings break. Uh, and the point is that when you take this limit, when string goes to infinity, so first of all, these processes, when works are being fire produced and break the string, they, uh, their probability goes to zero, they become suppressed. So you do get these very long strings. And in addition, what happens is that these strings were well, as you take two strings, strings are like basically like shoelaces, right? So as they go through each other, but they are quantum shoelaces. And as, as they go through each other in this limit, 
uh, something remarkable happens that they actually go through each other without kind of interacting, without say breaking and uh, 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 without shorter strings be being uh, produced. And that's, if you think about it, it's quite remarkable. So a string is actual physical object that could have been here in the room and kind of postulates and it has energy momentum tensor. And for objects like that to go through each other I cannot show that, right? Would not they reconnect? Or, uh, I, well, in the in C, strict and C to infinity limit, they don't reconnect. And then what they tell us is that we're getting really kind of fundamental geometric object in this limit, which is kind of two-dimensional fundamental uh, geometry. Uh, that's what this theory reduces to in this limit, which is another way to say that we're getting two-dimensional quantum gravitational system. Or in other words, the strings becomes as, as fundamental in this limit as critical strings. But and that's, I think, what indicates that this theory, which we all know and thinks it's somewhat boring, it hides really some structures which are very interesting to understand. And that's kind of the, my motivation to do what I'm doing. And hopefully we'll make some progress on that uh, within this collaboration. And last thing to say, it's really, at least in my experience, kind of the progress which have been achieved, at least in the last decade, was largely driven by experiments, where experiments here, there, to a large extent, numerical simulations. That's why we have lattice field theorists. But kind of studying this question, it was really model building. So we have input from data, and we build models which kind of try to uh, fit that data and use that as input to move further. So kind of if you are beyond the standard model fitted system, and if you're waiting for the next collider to come, come up and produce new exciting physics, which may take another three decades or something, I think that I can see this that it's like a, a good hobby to spend these 30 years <laughs> trying to answer these questions. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. All right, we're already over, so I'm not going to say anything more. Thanks, everybody. And there should be refreshments. Okay, nice.